Now tonight is uh, the fifth um, time that we're together in this uh, series called Embrace the Journey, and it's produced by Anglicans for Life. It was written by Deacon Georgette Fournay. And uh, as uh, Al uh, touched on, we're looking at what can really truly be said very, very difficult subjects. Hastening death, that's a nice way to speak about euthanasia and assisted suicide, and then funeral plans. But as we do, we need to always remember the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ to all of us who are believers in, the, in Christ, uh, that he spoke in the opening words of his Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitude, where he said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. These are the words of God, the confidence that we have in him. Now, over the last centuries in the Western world, and especially in the last decades of our nation, there has been an erosion and now an outright rejection of the Christian and biblical worldview of God and his laws concerning life. With this, there has not only come to be the slaughter of unborn at the beginning of life in abortion, but the assault at the end of life in this world. First, with the consideration of so-called euthanasia, which is called good death, and I hear the words, did God say? But then now, the outright denial of God's word with the legalization of physician-assisted suicide, and it is currently lawful in eight states, including our capital, the, the Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. <laughs> now, as Christians, we believe the truth of the written word of God, that the answer to the question, did God say, is an absolute and an emphatic, yes, he did. We believe that God is not only the creator of life with each person being made in his image at the moment of conception, but that he is the sovereign authority over life and death. The Lord Jesus declared that he is the life, and he said that he came to give life, but in utter and absolute opposition to the rule and will of God, Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what he said and in, in quoted in John chapter 10, verse 10. Now, the satanic spiritual war against God for the hearts and minds of people is manifested in our culture with the belief that the so-called, quote, right to die is not only ethically acceptable, but the final act of, human, of humanity's dignity, human dignity is affirmed through one dying. Now, such a belief reeks of the stench of the, of the deceit and the lies of the serpent, that a human being created in the image of God should act like God and be sovereign ruler over their own life to destroy themselves. The Lord God Almighty declared that to murder one made in his image is the highest form of hatred of him and deserves the just retribution of capital or the highest form of punishment. And that is in the Noahic covenant in Genesis chapter nine, verse six. Now this deceit can be heard in the names of two of the most pro proactive euthanasian assisted uh, suicide groups. First of all, compassion and choices. And the other, the final exit network. Now there's also the Death and Dignity National Center in Washington, DC. These organizations have multi-million dollar budgets with thousands of members and their intent is to legalize murdering human beings, create an image of God by euthanasia or assisted suicide. Now euthanasia literally means quote, good death, as if the greatest evil and enemy of life is good. It is the intentional act 
to cause the death of a person, typically by lethal injection or by deliberately withdrawing all medical care or food and fluids with the goal of causing the death of a person who isn't otherwise dying. Assisted suicide is defined as a person directly and intentionally involved in ending the life of another person or aiding, encouraging, or counseling for suicide. Physician-assisted suicide involves a doctor prescribing a lethal dose of medication that the patient administers to themselves. I had difficulty, in fact, using that word medication uh, because uh, when you call medication something medication, our, our idea is that it is medicine to help heal us, to sustain life. But something that's uh, given as medication to destroy, I think is really part of the deceitfulness of the use of words. Now, the main difference between euthanasia and assisted suicide is that in euthanasia, it is done to you. Someone gives you the lethal injection to kill you. In assisted suicide, the doctor writes the prescription for the lethal dose of, quote, medicine, knowing that you intend to take it to kill yourself. The goal of both is the same, death. In both instances, the person who wants to die initiates the procedure. However, we are now seeing more cases of involuntary euthanasia when a doctor or nurse deems it is time for the patient to die and gives a lethal injection without it being requested. Now advocates of euthanasia and assisted suicide use terms such as death with dignity, end of life options, medical aid in denial, physician assisted death, assisted death, and even dignicide. These phrases imply assisting someone in dying is a form of medical treatment that is not only a comfort, but to be embraced. Now, current laws require a person to request assisted suicide. But why would an individual seek help to kill themselves? Based on 20 years of reports from Oregon, which started allowing physician-assisted suicide in 1997. The number one reason people want to die is their fear of losing their autonomy, their so-called independence, or perhaps more popularly stated as the idea of freedom of choice. Now, I want to make a comment about this too, the word autonomy. Um, in many ways, in certain degrees, it can be something that's uh, good. But what this is ultimately about is the word autonomy means auto self and gnome means law, that you are the self law, you are the law giver, that you are the final law giver of your own life. Now close behind the lie of autonomous independence was the concern that they would be less able to engage in activities that make their lives enjoyable. Additional reasons people want to die were the sense of a loss of dignity, fear of being a burden, and losing control of bodily functions. Fear of pain and financial concerns about treatment costs actually came in last as reasons to die. One study found that the dominant characteristics of physician-assisted suicide patients was a greater than average preoccupation with self-determination, independence, and self-sufficiency. One patient said, quote, the dying process presented too much risk of becoming dependent. Now I wanna say that again. The dying process presented too much risk of becoming dependent. I always wondered about that. Did he say that before or after he died? <laughs> People who chose assisted suicide were described as recluse, crusty, demanding, solitary old ducks. That's truly a term from Oregon, old ducks. 
who did not have meaningful, and this is important, meaningful trusting relationships. And by the way, I'll just say this. That's what life is all about, relationships. Ultimately, relationship with God and relationship with one another. And the power of sin divides us from God and from other people. In other words, people who want to die are lonely, independent, socially isolated, with fears about being a burden, losing their dignity, and feeling worthless. Deacon Fournay asked, quote, if someone wants to die, why not just commit suicide? I think asking for assisted suicide should be seen as a cry for help under the guise of pride that is fed by fear. Hurting, lonely people need care and connection, not help to kill themselves. Behind each wish to hate, hasten death, researchers wrote, one finds hidden desires for understanding and for someone to accompany them in their suffering and in their mourning for what has already been lost. Researchers also noted that once the patient felt listened to and not so alone, they often stopped wanting to hasten their death, unquote. The desire to believe one was ultimately in control of their life was also an important factor motivating the desire to hasten death. Certainly, these poor souls do not believe that after they die, they will stand before God on the day of judgment to give an account of their life and death. Scripturally, this is a manifestation of the serpent's lie, that one will be, quote, like God, as one attempts to maintain sovereign control and rule and determine good and evil over their own life. Bishop Derek Jones, who oversees the jurisdiction of armed forces and chaplaincy, observed, quote, when we come to the end of our life, we want to be able to try to exercise some sort of control. But what we don't understand or what we're not remembering is that God, who is the author of life, who provides us grace, will give us the grace to see us through the difficulty of the body to the point of time that he appoints for us to be returned to him. For us to hasten that along is really quite an act of narcissism and an idea of, quote, I'm wiser than God. That body can convince the mind this is a better thing for everybody. For those that are in the midst of it, I've seen people who said, boy, I wish they would just die. Then they feel guilty for it because they realize that's not really a loving approach. Others would suggest when you do euthanasia to an animal, you're doing the animal a favor. That's because God gave dominion over the animals. Uh, and so we, excuse me, that's because God gave dominion over the animals to us. And so we can't equate the two. We can only look at one and then the other. We have dominion over their lives. And therefore we have, we have exercised our judgment to say, this is a time that their life should end. It cannot be equated to the human element that is in relationship with the, its creator and the one who is the author and the holder of our lives, which is God, needs to be placed and held solely and wholly in his hand, unquote. Now there are numerous pr practical problems and issues associated with assisted suicide and euthanasia. In fact, there are at least 10 and among them are these. First, when assisted suicide is legalized, it is considered, quote, medical treatment and often becomes the only treatment covered by insurance. Now, I thought about that myself. I mean, isn't it interesting that you spend all this money that you pay an insurance company to give you health and medicine, and now at the end of your life, the only thing they want to pay for is your death? Two, 
Patients who have employed assisted suicide imagine a quick, peaceful death without complications. But MD Magazine recently featured an article by two physicians who described multiple cases of assisted suicide that involved difficulty in ingesting or regurgitating the drugs, patients regaining consciousness, nausea, vomiting, and gasping. Three, more and more, there are doctors whose sole practice is prescribing lethal medications. There's no mandatory reporting for doctors beyond the number of prescriptions written. Four, there is a lack of accountability of filled prescriptions. These pills can easily be mixed in applesauce or yogurt and given to anyone without them knowing they are ingesting a lethal dose of medication. Six, there is also no requirement for a physician to be present when the lethal pills are administered. So no one would know if the patient was force fed them against their will. We know of one such case in the Netherlands where the doctor enlisted the help of family members to hold down an elderly woman with dementia while he gave her the lethal injection. Just appalling. Six, citing issues like self-determination and informed consent Anyone seeking assisted suicide is not required to be examined for lucidity or other psychiatric disorders. I mean, frankly, it used to be you were crazy if you wanted to kill yourself. Now it's death with dignity. So nothing protects someone from being coerced into requesting assisted suicide. The physician could refer to a second opinion as to the patient's mental case and state, but rarely does. Seven, proponents of assisted suicide and euthanasia also say it is only available for those with six months or less to live. However, doctors readily admit it is almost impossible to accurately predict how long a person will live with any given diagnosis. Eight, legalized killing also creates problems for doctors who object to participating in assisted suicide as efforts to force them to either write prescriptions or refer to doctors who will help kill. It just goes against their conscience. Nine, a critical issue is that this creates trust problems, trust problems for patients and their doctors. If I know my doctor is willing to help someone die, Will I trust him to care for me? Or do quotas and cost containment goals take priority? And then 10, the worst element is the effect of laws for assisted suicide. And it is the increased suicide rates in states where it is illegal. Our nation is increasingly become a culture of death with not only the promotion of, but the glorification of assisted suicide and euthanasia in the media. This is being done through movies, such as the 2004 Best Picture Award winner, Million Dollar Baby. Television shows that create sympathy for people in pain and suffering. And that, by the way, is this on? Am I on? Randy? My, okay, good. If my computer's off, I mean, it's a picture, that's fine. Um, television shows that create sympathy for people in pain and suffering. And let me say this, that's always the bridge, pain and suffering, uh, that appeals to people one way or another. And music that glorifies death and suicide. Another tactic used to increase public support for assisted suicide and euthanasia is in managing and creating the words used to discuss death, such as death with dignity or right to die, along with the names of organizations such as compassion and choices. All of these have one goal, the intentional death of human beings 
made in the image of God. Every year, 15 to 20 state legislators see bills introduced because assisted suicide proponents need a few more states to legalize it before they can take a case to the Supreme Court demanding that a right to die be made available to citizens nationwide. All it, all it takes is one case before the Supreme Court, like Roe versus Wade. As Christians who believe what God has revealed in the scriptures, we must understand that the most basic issue is a spiritual war between Satan and God with the loss of biblical ethics and outright anti-Christ rebellion against God. As Ron Panzer, president of Hospice Patients Alliance stated, quote, we live in a society, a global society, that has been dominated in modern times by secular humanism or modernism that embraces an ethic of quality of life as the determinant of whether a life is worth living whereas the sanctity of life ethic, we recognize life comes from God. In the secular mindset, they say, man is the determinant of what is right and wrong. The divine law is thrown out. Over the secular, once the secular humanists throw, out, throw this out, then they can create their own law, their own morality based on whatever they come up with. The doctors are actually taught they can do harm or hasten death in some circumstances. That it's right because the patient may be suffering. So therefore, relieve suffering. They say, uh, they say we will relieve the patient of their life to relieve suffering. It's kind of insanity. It's upside down morality and upside down ethics. And it is a fulfillment of scripture. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, where God says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light, for dark and, and substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, heartbreakingly, this antichrist ethic is increasingly accepted by those who profess, and I say profess, to be followers of Christ. A recent survey by Lifeway found 49% of those who attend religious services at least once a month say assist, physician assisted suicide is morally acceptable and agree with the statement, quote, when a person is facing a painful terminal disease, it is morally acceptable to ask for a doctor's help in taking his or her own life. In my opinion, and this is me, the only hope for America is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only hope for the church is a true spiritual revival that will result in a true repentance and return to God to believe and obey his holy word. And I'll just say this, this is one of the reasons I'm here in this church. Uh, when Michelle and I were looking for a church, um, I looked online and I came up with uh, Al's teaching on over and under. And I never heard it put so clearly, I was in a denomination that faced these issues. And when he said, is you're either over the word of God or under the word of God, I said, that's the best I've ever heard it stated. And we are here under the word of God because we believe the word of God. Now, the actual humanity and dignity of all people made in the image of God is threatened by the culture of death. Nevertheless, death is a reality. Scripture says that death all who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ will depart from their physical body and go to be present with the Lord. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8, quote, so we are always of good courage. Now notice that, always of good courage, never discouraged, disheartened. 
We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. What then are the practical issues involved with planning a funeral or a memorial service? Now, the difference between the two is this, that a funeral is defined as a service in which the deceased's body is present. Of course, they're not present. And memorial service is one which the body is not present. Now, the first thing is simply to understand the value of pre-planning a funeral or a memorial service. When a person does this, the greatest benefit for is, uh, it is the greatest benefit for those responsible. Now, the following are five practical matters involved in this process. First of all, burial or cremation. Whether you choose for your body to be cremated or buried and where it is to be buried, it is recommended that you pre-plan your funeral. You can go to a funeral home to help you through the planning process. It is also beneficial to include your family in this, letting them know the answers to questions like, what do you want done with your body? What cemetery do you want to be buried in? If you want to be cremated, would you like your ashes stored in an urn or scattered? Where do you want the urn stored? Well, it may seem awkward to have a discussion about these things. When we die, your loved ones will appreciate the fact that you took care of these things. Talking about it relieves them from trying to guess or question if they did it right, or worse, them squabble, squabbling over decisions. That's a sad thing. Second, once the death, once, uh, the death of your loved one occurs, it is time to notify the proper authorities. If the death happens in a hospital, a hospice or a nursing home, their personnel will declare them dead and then call the funeral home. Third, funeral plans. Typically, there are three elements to planning a funeral. First, there are the details that need to be addressed with your church for either a burial service or a memorial service. Second, there are the funeral details that relate to preparing your loved ones, uh, your loved one for cremation or funeral. Then third, the final resting place for the body, either burial in a cemetery or ashes in an urn, which can be placed in a mausoleum, kept at home, or simply spread somewhere. Then fourth, the service. Churches usually have a form they will ask you to fill out, noting your specific request. Questions can include, what hymns do you want? What scripture readings do you prefer? Who do you want to conduct the service? It is possible to either hold the entire service in the church or a part of the service at, at the church followed by a committal at a mausoleum or gravesite. You can advise them if you want to hold any type of reception after the service. If the service is at the funeral home, they will also give a list of things involved. And that brings us to the fifth thing, the funeral home. An essential part of planning involves the preparation of the body and the funeral itself at the funeral home. This involves a conference with the funeral, funeral director, which can last anywhere between one hour to two hours. Now there are four different components of the conference. One is the vital information for the death certificate and obituary. This would include the social security number, birth date, birthplace, patient's names, including the mother's maiden name, occupation, education, where they lived, what cemetery or crematory they would be using. Then also, if they're a veteran, a copy of their discharge because they would be eligible for some benefits. The second is gathering information for an obituary. This would be who they're related to, where their cities and states of location were, how long they were a resident in an area, 
organizations they belong to, special education and employment. And third is how many death certificates are needed. When the death certificate is completed, the documentation is forwarded to the coroner. And in the case of cremation, a letter of permission is given for uh, cremation. And then the fourth is simply a general price list. All funeral directors are required to have a general price list that will have certain packages available. That's truly a euphemism, a package, <laughs> such as a cremation package. I wonder if Amazon delivers a traditional package or a memorial service. Presently, the medium cost, and I say presently, medium cost of a funeral of viewing and cremation is more than $6,000, with cemetery and burial services additional. Now, there will be other tasks, such as ordering flowers, planning a reception, the time, times for calling hours, and when the family is to uh, arrive at the funeral home. The last question for the funeral process is to be addressed as a final resting place for your loved one, whether there is a family burial plot or one that needs to be purchased. <coughs> now returning to the importance of having conversations with our loved ones about, it. this always happens to me about this time of the talk. Yeah, give me some water, please. <coughs> One, whoa. Pardon me? No, no mouth to mouth resuscitation. Thank you, Dr. Corley. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> My wife might give it to me. But... Returning the importance of having conversation with our loved ones <clears throat> about aging and dying. I love this. Here is a tender testimony of Bishop Wesley Nolden. Retired Reformed Episcopal Church Bishop from the Diocese of Quincy about his experience with his mother. He shared, quote, I will tell you a personal experience that I had with my mother. She and I had a conversation about what she wanted to have happen when she died a long time before she was ever ill or ever died. That was helpful to both of us. First of all, there was no artificial barrier, barrier on death. We became comfortable discussing that. It also modeled behavior for my wife and our children to see their grandmother talking openly with their dad about how do I want to transition into the next life? How do I want to have this happen to me when I die? What do I want to happen after I die? When that time came, I actually held my mother as she died. After her death, I knew exactly what to do. I knew exactly what her wishes were. It was so much easier for me. I didn't have to make that decision how she wanted this, how she wanted this. I knew precisely in terms of the grieving process, it helps facilitate the grieving process. You don't second guess yourself. You don't try to figure out that. We all have to go through the grieving process in our own way. It takes its own time. There are things to do like this and that can help us prepare. It's really having an opportunity to get to encourage the family to go talk to someone and prepare their funeral. It's not a negative thing. We prepare for a lot of things. One of the things we don't do in our society is prepare for death very well, unquote. Finally, consider the comment by Reverend Rick Burr that reinforces the importance and value having conversations with our loved ones about aging and dying. Quote, dying is not an individual event. It is a communal initiative. The final chapter of life needs to take into consideration the impact of our, our death has on those around us for the sake of the kingdom. As soon as you make it only about yourself, 
you eliminate the impact you have on your family and friends. The conversation becomes totally centered upon what is good for you. And that becomes a primarily primary goal in all decision making. I believe in dignity and dying, but I also believe that life has purpose until the very end and that we must allow God to use us as his light till our last breath. I've seen the impact of this over and over again, as families are brought together over a dying loved one, unquote. For us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, death is not the end of life. You know, it's, I just want to make this comment. There's so much secularism in this world. You know, you think this is the end. It's just not true. Life goes on one way or the other. We are living forever. For we who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're living forever, whether in this world or the next. But when our mortal bodies die, our funeral or memorial service can become an occasion for the gospel message to be proclaimed to those who don't know Christ. And there may be no more powerful time when the reality of death confronts people and when the true hope of eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ can be presented. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. By the way, I'm thinking of the testimony of what happened with George Mueller. Many of us have perhaps remember who he was. He was the man who had the orphanage in England, who just simply prayed by faith. He had who knows how many orphans in his orphanage that God provided. He prayed, had a list of prayer for 100 people that he was praying for their salvation. <clears throat> During his life, 98 of those people came to Christ. Two did not before he died. But at his funeral, the last two came to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Powerful funeral. Because Christ died, Christ is risen, and Christ is coming again. All of us in Christ, meaning all who are true believers and have been born of the Spirit, have been, as Peter wrote, born again to a living hope. Because this is our confession. Our confession is like that of Job, who in the midst of suffering, loss and pain declared, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. Amen. Now next week, we'll conclude with topics of grieving and the role of the church in suffering and death. And now we can turn to questions and hopefully some answers. Thank you, Bill. For those that have any questions, please raise your hand. I, there's, I think I can see everyone. What's that? Yeah. Baba Corley is saying part of this is going to come before the Supreme Court. You can see it. Of course, that's where the progress of progressivism, which is just another word for <clears throat> the progress of turning away from God. <laughs> it's just another nice word. Okay, do we have any questions? Any thoughts? Any questions? Well, is it? I look. I'm I look like George has asked a question. You were on mute, George. I was. Um, I have a question. Could you comment on the um, memorial service and the funeral service? The different purposes of those, and how these are um, perhaps a 
uh, real help in communicating the gospel uh, at, at the end of life, at the uh, when, when, when a person has died. Could you comment on that, please, Bill? Well, I think ooh, this, uh, we got the rebound here. Uh, Let me see where the. Here we go. Okay, uh, we got it. Um, I mean, I think the ultimate purpose, if we're Christian, is the same. You know, the proclamation of the reality of death. Second, and most important, the reality that Christ died and rose again from the dead, and that through faith in him, we have eternal life and the confidence we have. And now in terms of the difference between uh, a memorial service and a funeral, you know, it's kind of like these words are now, uh, historically they were different, but they're more and more being mixed together uh, and I don't know if Al has, do you have anything that you would say about the differences in terms of a service? I, I mean, basically, as I said, the difference is that the body is there or the body is not. Yeah. Bill, Bill if I could, what I've experienced, yeah. Yeah, what, what I've experienced is that memorial services typically for me have been at the funeral home chapel. And then uh, the funeral service would be at the church and then the, and then we do a uh, the burial right there, or the memorial service would be where the body is going to be either transported out of state. Um, so that, that would be, I think your definition was spot on where the body is present or the remains are present and, uh, or, or they are not because they are either prepositioned somewhere else for burial. Yeah. Or, or there may be a grave site. And I think your question was to the purpose. The purpose ultimately is, as I said, you know, the confidence we have in the living Lord Jesus Christ. Um, could I ask, but following up. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. okay. I can't. Uh, the, go ahead. A funeral right. service has liturgical elements to it that um, are they not quite solemn and and um, historic? And it seems to me that oftentimes in a memorial service, it becomes you know a lot of comments about how wonderful a person was, but the opportunity for a sermon or for a a Kind of, you know, a, a real consideration of the impact of death is not there. And, and I, that, that just is what I, I have sensed from observing both. Um, and I, I just thought that, I, I personally think that a funeral service has more profound importance because of its liturgical significance and elements. Well, I, I guess what I would say is that um, words go through transitions and culturally connoted. And, you know, and so I, th I think what you're sharing is what an observation you've made. What I, another observation I'd make too about the uh, ethos of funerals. Um, I think more and more with the secularization of our culture. And it's almost the belief that all there is is this life. Uh, and I'm not saying it's wrong in itself because there is appropriate places, but I've been to funerals or memorials, whatever one you wanna call them, where basically most of what people say is just humorous. Uh, they try to make funny jokes about the person. They try to say this or that. And I believe that, um, as I said, there's times that's appropriate to say funny things. Um, but I think if that's the whole ethos, you're really disguising the reality of what it's all about. You're not facing the truth of death and the reality of death and the actuality that, and I'll just say this too, I mean, contrast cultures that would mourn 
I mean, you know, you look in the Bible and they mourn for Jacob 40 days. Uh, you know, our mourning is like hardly a moment. And then you just laugh it off. And I think, again, that's a culture that is so far away from the reality of who God is and the reality of, of eternity and what it's ultimately all about. And there's a loss of holy reverence as well as the fear of God uh, and the glory of God, ultimately, that Christ has triumphed over death and that we have eternal life in him. Thank you, Bill. I, I have a, a question on chat. Anybody else? Bill, I, I have a question on chat that wanted to for you to say your quote again, starting off with the only hope for the America, the only hope for America is the church. Well, Did what I said, it? whoops, I get. Hang on, I'll mute. Okay, try again. Bill, you're muted. Bill, you're still muted. Oh, there we go. I got to unmute myself. We're getting, um, okay. I don't know if I was on. I said that um, the only hope for the world in America is the church. And that's because the church is the life giver, God's ordained means of true, there's common grace. The true life giving comes from the church. It's the salt, it's the light of the world. And the only hope for the church now, as it's always been, is a move of God that I call a revival. And a revival means to bringing back to life what had already been made alive. It's not awakening like the world is awakened out of death, but a revival where the Holy Spirit comes into the hearts of people whether whatever it looks like on the outside can be different. But what it is on the inside is true repentance. And true repentance comes to first believe the word of God, what God has said. And secondly, you cannot separate true faith from action. There aren't three categories. I believe, I believe and obey, or I believe and don't obey. That's just, there's no category like that. True repentance mean I believe and I do. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so we believe the word of God. We come back under the authority of the word of God. We repent. We turn from our sinful ways and God renews us. And through that, that's what historically is done in great times of distress, great times of evil. And so the only hope, you know, in my opinion for America is the church and a revival in the church. And I, I want to say this, we should be praying for that. You know, not just our government, that our government leaders somehow will turn back. Yeah, thank God for that. But we need revival. God works through his church and we should be praying for the church and pastors and preachers and to repent and teachers to believe the word of God and teach it. Amen, thank you, Bill. All right. Well, that that kind of wraps it up for the evening. Um, can we have a? We had a little teaser for next week, which is our new uh, mini series. And uh, with that, let me just turn it over to Al to uh, close us up and pray us out. Okay. From air traffic control back in the back here. <laughs> I'm in the back of the room doing technology. Um, yeah. Next week is our last week on. Um, the Embrace the Journey series, and then we'll get into our Easter series uh, on miracles, and then into our um, Life Together uh, Easter series. So um, thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, let me uh, just um, conclude with a final prayer. The Lord be with you. Father, as we enter uh, and prepare to enter Holy Week next week, would you continue to speak to us not only about our own plans and, and about just decisions that we need to make, every one of us, no matter what age or stage of life, but also, Lord, would you continue to pour into us the promise of eternity and what you have done for us as we wash each other's feet next week, as we um, 
hear the passion read once again, as we see the stripping of the altar, all that you have done for us to pave the way for us into eternal life. Thank you, Father. Help us to leave here tonight as people of the promise, knowing with certainty that what you've done for us truly is enough. As we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord, everybody. Thanks be to God. Peace to you.